Oh, he is on there. Oh, there we are. <laughs> I must be quick. Welcome and good morning. Good morning. Come on in from the foyer. We're getting started. We uh, have um, a handful of us up here this morning. Our drummer decided to go camping. Dan. <laughs> So the expectation is that you join in and you sing loud and you join our voices together to praise our Father in heaven, thanking him for what he has done for us.
I'll get it. <laughs> In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy.
to be partakers of. We love you and bless you and praise you and glorify your name this morning as one voice and one heart, your bride, your body. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Pat Poole. I'm one of the elders at the church here. I'd like to uh, uh, open up the Bible this morning in, in Genesis 22, which is a, uh, a story that you're probably all familiar with. It has very special significance to Neil's sermon this morning, though. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took his hand, in his hand, the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where's the lamb? For the burnt offering... And Abraham said, God will provide himself, for himself, the lamb for a burnt offering. I think the King James says, God will provide himself. So they went, both of them, together. <clears throat> when they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. 
He said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mouth of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Ab Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Let's pray. Lord, you tested, you put Abraham's faith to the test. We really can't imagine in our lives the unsettling challenge this may have, must have been for him. Have his own notion of how you'd fulfill the promise or just have faith that you would. And Lord, we face challenges in our faith as well. The blessings you dis, dis, uh, that you bestow on us are really of no value until we're willing, if necessary, to lose him so that you will reign in our hearts without any rivals. Lord, today we celebrate the blessing of the country that you have given us. Even so, it's our tendency to, as human beings, to focus on the gift and not the giver. We can so easily declare our independence as a patriot and allow ourselves to be independent of you and your calling on our lives. Help us, Lord, to realize every moment that our hope is not in this country. We have to tie our hope to you. Our confident expectation, Lord, is that you will fulfill your plan and in Jesus' name, we thank you that we get to be part of it. Amen. See him there, the great I
And Lord, we thank you for this time, and we ask one thing, that you would be glorified this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. much. Good morning. All of you who did not go to the lake, uh, welcome and blessings on you. <laughs> and welcome to Luke and Laura and their children. Yeah, that's very bright. Let's see. I can... <laughs> These two up here, can we kind of turn those down a little bit? Because I'm going blind. Yeah. If you have a Bible, uh, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. First time I ever tried to preach something from this chapter, it was at Fourth Memorial Church, and I had been uh, the recipient of a whole, I don't know, four months of education at Biola. So I preached from this passage. And Pastor Underhill said afterwards, I said, how did I do? He said, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the men's group that meets on Tuesday night is going through Hebrews, and it just happened to fall on this section. And I would say it, is, it, it seems to me that my prayer has been, Lord, I want to preach a message on the birthday of our country, the 4th of July, that will help your people as we live in a country that's increasingly non-sympathetic toward people who follow Christ. I will leave it to you to measure whether this message does that, but that's my intent, that's been my prayer. So if you have your Bible, and if you found uh, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, you can uh, stand if you are able and if you so desire for the reading of God's word. Let us pray first. Father, we bow in your presence. Lord, thank you that we can sing from our hearts words of worship and praise and our great trust in you. And we want you, Lord, to be extolled and lifted up in our thoughts, in our worship. Help us to appreciate, Lord, uh, what you're saying to us is words of hope and encouragement in times like these when other things seem to be crumbling. And Lord, and nothing about your plan has ever uh, misfired, and it will not. We trust you. So we ask for your blessing this morning on your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Just as a little bit of a, alleviate your worry, I am not trying to preach this entire chapter. <laughs> I'm only reading uh, this so that you know that there's a context that helps the verses that I'm selected to make sense to all of us. Is that all right? Yeah. There are probably 50 sermons in this one <laughs> chapter. The writer of Hebrews goes on. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, hear the word of God. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God, to their own harm, and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that, uh, that often falls on it and produces a crop is useful to those for whom sake it is cultivated 
it receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burnt. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, which I'm assuming is the promise and the oath, so by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus is gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's obvious, I think, to everybody here that the writer of Hebrews knew uh, something of the people to whom he was sending this uh, letter or sermon. A lot of people think it's more like a sermon than it is a letter. But nevertheless, he was aware that for people who gather to follow Christ, uh, there are dangers. There is a possibility of falling away, of drifting away. And so he writes these words, and these are strong words. And you say, Neil, can you give us all the answers? No. I'm not even going to try. I want to focus on just something that really captured my memory. I'm saying all this because these are great words of encouragement, and they're very needful for us as God's people in times like these, where the things that we thought were so stable, where we may have anchored our hope as Patrick G. Poole has said, uh, they don't look so very uh, tough right now. It's, uh, some things are crumbling. God's people need to know that there is a sure, secure, safe, unmovable, solid place that you can anchor your soul. We apparently need to know that our soul can kind of drift and be pushed around. And we need something that won't fail us that will hold, right? All right, so I'm just saying that there's a part here that's kind of interesting, and it's verse 9 through 12, and I want to go through that kind of fast, so I'm just going to say some things. You say, you're not, you're not expounding the whole thing. No, because I'm, I'm going on to verse 13. So, uh, but it, there, this is kind of setting the stage. This is a little bit like a preamble. This states what the writer of Hebrews in his heart longs for and desires for these people that he addresses as beloved. Say, so why is he saying, why is he calling them beloved? Well, he loves them. But may, and the people that he's talking to are beloved by God. 
They are beloved. It's not just a word that we stick it in there. You know, like when you go get a cup of coffee, they say perfect. And I say, no, I didn't perfect. But you know, <laughs> beloved means beloved here. Though we speak in this way, <clears throat> beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Now, without question, salvation is a subject in the Bible that is very huge. And many other subjects are subsumed under this mega subject of salvation. So he's not going to unpack everything, but he wants to talk about something. For God, and look at verse 10. For God, I'm glad that he moves that out there. He starts it. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. In other words, if God is not unjust, then he must be just, right? There's one way of saying it. That, and he, he doesn't forget anything. He's recording things. Somehow these people need to be reminded of that or he wouldn't have written it. God is not unjust to forget your work and the love you have shown for his name. And you know what it says, it, right here it says, in serving the saints, the, you, God is not unjust to us to overlook your work. Usually you can see somebody's work. And the love that you've shown for his name. These are kind of conjoined here. You say, why, well, why did he put it that way? I, I saw, we saw a movie one time made in who knows where, Europe somewhere, about uh, the, the Dutch people trying to repair a dike, you know, and uh, this one wife and her husband was working. With, all the men were conscripted. They all had to go repair a leak in the dike, and most of their house was underwater. And this, this gal goes to the uh, house of her mom, and she's kind of complaining, complaining, my husband, he works like 16 hours a day, and I hardly see him, and, and our house is underwater, and we don't have enough food and all this stuff, and the mother is living on higher ground in a nicer house, and the mother very wisely says to her daughter, oh, my dear, have I taught you nothing? Do you not realize that Labor is love made manifest. And he is pointing out that God is not unjust to forget their work and the love that they've shown for his name in serving the saints as they are doing, and he wants them to keep on doing it. So as he moves through this preamble, he talks about his desire for them. And we desire... Each one of you, each one of you, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have, earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Now, this word, earnestness, is one of my favorite words, especially in Greek, but I won't tell you what it is at Spo Day. But anyway... <laughs> Um, it means it's not just no big deal to you. Earnestness means you are on your metal. You take this seriously. God wants you to do something. You do it. We want you to manifest the full uh, same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Here, he just introduces the subject. Hope. Hope. People can live without uh, food, they say, for a number of days. They can live for water only three or four days. But human beings cannot live without hope. It's a great need that we have. Uh, you say, well, he's not talking much about it here. No, but let me just go on. Do you have the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end? And then he's aware of us. He knows humans very well. So that you may not become sluggish. This is a hard word for us to translate here. But imitators, imitators, he said, I want you to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So here we get the word faith conjoined with patience, stick to itiveness. 
perseverance. True faith is persevering faith. And it says, it is for who? These people that he says are looking to uh, imitate people who do that, who are in to inherit the promises. So this is the, like the way the writer of Hebrews does that. He kind of drops words in there, knowing that he's going to talk about them a good deal as he keeps going. So here we get to verse 13. He goes back into the history. This is, in fact, a book written, a letter, a sermon written for Jewish people. We call it Hebrews. You know, Very interestingly, it was not written in Hebrew. It was written in Greek. But anyway, we can say maybe it's even for us. But uh, he tells them of their history. We as God's people also have a history, right? So he takes them to their history. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having waited patiently, this is kind of interesting. When we were translating this section in our village, uh, I, I was the Bible translator at one time. You know. so anyway, um, I worked in with about six or eight guys around the table and working through this very section. And Pastor Paul is there. And we got to this part. We're trying to figure out, Abraham, after he had waited patiently, you know what Paul said? We had just finished Genesis, you know. He said, he said well, it wasn't all that patient. <laughs> I said, well, this is what's written here. So then, after that, <clears throat> so when God made this promise, and so Abraham, having waited patiently, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. And it's kind of a key word here, promises, promises. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Now, this is all language of the courtroom, the legal matters. That's what all this forensic language is here. Apparently, humans sometimes argue about things. <laughs> and there was a, a, what they did was, Swear an oath. But we used to put our hands on the Bible. I don't know what people put their hands on these days. Well, you swear by, and by God in the Bible to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is that right? People used to say that. I don't know if they still do that. But this writer knows that these people know that every oath that they ever were to make, the Hebrew people were commanded in the word of God to swear by the name of God, by God's name. Why? Why would that be written in the Old Testament? Be, well, you're very quiet. <laughs> because our thoughts, actions, and words, we are answerable to the ultimate authority, to a transcendent God who doesn't miss anything, who's never wrong. Amen? Amen. So God swears by himself because there is no greater one to see. Whereby. Now look at verse 17. So, oh, I love that word. So, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things, which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled, and you think, Hold it, hold it. Where did we come in here? He was talking about Abraham and the heirs. And he says, we. Hmm. What do you make of that? Are we included in this group of people called the heirs of the promises? See, he's expecting that people can connect some dots here, right? So you have, you have to be full of spode. You have to be on your metal. This morning to listen to this, all right? Is that okay? Yeah. So he says, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. 
Do you notice something here? There's a little phrase that slips in there. It represents just one word. It says, we who have fled for refuge. Why did he say that? We were talking about God making these great promises. We were talking about he even swore by his own name. He swore by himself. He made an oath. I will do what I promised you I will do. So why does he say we who have fled for refuge? You're all looking at me like, boy, that's a real stump, stumper, Neil. Eh? People flee from danger. People flee to safety. People run away from imminent annihilation and destruction. It says, we who have fled for refuge, and then it doesn't stop there without taking a breath. It says, we're reaching forward to grab a hold of something. I would too if I was running for my life, would you? We're reaching to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. And you think, come on, hope? That's kind of one of those words, you know, kind of... You going to graduate from high school, Neil? I hope so. You know, kind of. <laughs> Not this hope. There's absolutely no uncertainty about what he's talking about. God wants the heirs of the promise to know the unchangeable character of his purpose. And he makes us promise with ink on parchment. And he says, this I am going to do for you. Do you think God's people today need a hope like that? Where there's no doubt whatsoever whether this is going to happen. This is going to happen. God's going to be true to all his promises. He's big enough, strong enough. His memory is not like mine. He'll remember everything, right? Okay. So it's by two unchangeable things. Now you say, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, Neil. You didn't tell us what we're refugees from. Why? What's going on here? Who's chasing us? Why are we fleeing for refuge? You're looking at me very puzzled. Well, you could say, uh, maybe they're running for the people that persecute them. I doubt it because you can't run that fast. Uh, besides, we're called to go into the world. We're go, go, called to go and face the foe and preach the gospel where people are going to kill us anyway, right? So that can't be the right answer. Does God mean something? Well, you could say, you know, we're talking about the whole, uh, there's a, we, here we have no enduring city, but we're looking at the city that is to come. So we're fleeing from this place. It's all falling apart. And we're going to go into a heavenly city that can't fall apart. Is that it? Is that the refuge? Is that the safety we're looking for? Yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. You'd say, Neil, you're supposed to give us all the right answers. Sorry. As I prayed about this and looked at this, and I read all the way through the whole book looking for answers to this, I'd say the author juxtaposed the idea of fleeing for refuge right to reaching toward the hope. Isn't that curious? Huh? If this is so certain, and this hope is not just hope like American hope, this is like an anchor, firm and secure. Like the psalm writer of old who wrote the song, Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor, steadfast and sure. Grounded in the rock that cannot move, grounded in the, the unfailing love of Jesus Christ, our God. Amen? Amen? Grounded, firm, and sure. So you say, you're skipping something, Neil. You didn't tell us about this flee for refuge. I'm going to be a little bit transparent here. Uh, you say, well, 
What do you think it means? Well, I, I'm not really sure. But listen very carefully. I know that God knows that we need to run to him often and often in our world as God's people. We need his protection. We need his refuge. We are, in fact, refugees in this world right now because this is not our home. So I don't know here, but as I prayed about this, I thought, ah, fleeing for refuge, running to safety. Many and often times things plague me. You'd say, you're supposed to be a really mature Christian here because you're an elder, right? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, wor I'm a work in progress here. But listen, sometimes within us all as Christians, there's that incessant murmur of self-recrimination. And sometimes we need to run and lay hold on a hope that is absolutely sure because we think, man, if it, if it rests on my record or my ability, I'm going to flunk out and be not even make it to kindergarten here. This is the mindset that this author wants. He wants you to know that you're fleeing for safety. He wants you to know you're a refugee. And then he doesn't stop there. He says, ha, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure and sure. And it says it enters in behind the veil where Christ who has gone as a forerunner has, has entered in on our behalf. It was so funny when we were translating this. Also, Pastor Paul says, we worked hard to get a word for anchor. There's no lakes around where we live. This is the jungle. 1,500 square miles of jungle where it rains 400 inches of rain a year. You think there'd be lots of lakes. Nope. There's a lot of underground caves is what there is. So what'd you do? Well, I explained. An anchor is like a heavy object that the guys down there on the coast of Papua, they get something heavy, they tie a rope to it with their dinghy or with their dugout canoe, they go out there in the Gulf of Papua to fish, they want, they throw it, throw it down, and it hits on the bottom of the sand, yeah, 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 and so that the current or the tide or the wind can't push them around, so it stays in one place, right? Yeah, I said, you have a word for that? No. So I keep talking, and Oliver says, stop talking. I'm thinking. <laughs> he says, no, no, we don't have a word for that. We don't do that because we, are, we live here in a bush. But there is something we do do. Do you want to know what it is? So I go, ah, which is yes in Porba. Breathe in, go, ah. see that's yes. Try it. Yeah. You want to know how we translated this? Oliver said to me, no, we don't have a word for that. But when we're making fences around our gardens, we must make fences around our gardens because pigs like to get in and eat and they can destroy months of work overnight. So that fence has to keep out pigs. And these pigs are not the little piggies that we have here. These are tough pigs with thick necks and big tusks. And they can get into a lot of fences. He says, when we make our fences, we choose a big, heavy, hardwood log one that doesn't rot, <clears throat> and we cut that from where we're cutting and roll it into a little ditch that we made that's about half the, the diameter of the log, and we push that log into that ditch so it's half in the ditch and half out, and, and then there's a big stake that leans toward where the pigs are and a fork thing, and then we put a smaller log here and here and here, and those pigs, they work, they can smell the food on the other side. They come in there with their, their big heads and they can push a lot of dirt around. I might tell you, but they can't, you know why they can't move it? Because that is a diddy doo betting me I'm at the top. In other words, an anchor is something that nothing can move. 
We have this hope as an anchor. And this hope goes right into the presence of God, where Jesus Christ has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. You say, wait a minute, how can we have a hope like an anchor, but it's, but it's entering in the veil? That's the genius of what is said here. Our hope is not just imaginary. It's based on an actual, real condition that God has granted us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing, nothing can shake that. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we need that hope. Help us to grasp it. Help us to persevere with earnestness, realizing it isn't our stickability that makes any difference. It's you that you change not. You have given us these promises. You have secured our everlasting security. And we thank you very, very much. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Neil, for bringing God's word to us today. Um, next week, we'll have the pleasure of hearing our, another elder, Kent Blanton's preaching. I don't know if he knows that yet, but he <laughs> will now. But um, And then on the 18th, Luke will be preaching um, that Sunday. No, it's, I'm not sure if it's that good. We'll see. The... Uh, Set the expectations low. No, but on the on the 18th, on the 18th, we will be having um, Art, one of the elders from Foothills Bible Church, will be up here. Um, he's going to share some of the word with us um, and kind of sending, as that church has sent Luke up here, um, and then Luke will preach, and we will have the opportunity to welcome him as a church. So a couple things on that. We will be having a barbecue potluck. Now... Barbecue potluck means we've already got hamburgers and hot dogs for everybody, so you can bring a side salad or cookies or ice cream. I'll take cookies and ice cream, um, but bring a side to share with everybody else, so that'll be the potluck part of it. We're still looking for a little bit of help um, cooking and barbecuing, so if you'd like to volunteer for that, that'd be great. Look at the newsletter. There's a You can click on that and sign up for that, but we'd love you guys to be here. Um, I think there's 400 people between Laura's family and Luke's family coming up and some of the folks being here. So there's going to be a wonderful opportunity to meet them and ask the true questions about who Luke is. And uh, But just a wonderful time. They are coming up because they are sending Luke and Laura to us, and we are welcoming them. So we want to be hospitable and loving to the families that are coming up as well, and a great time to celebrate what God has done in this church. Um, another announcement, just uh, pray this week. Jason Brownlee is probably in, well, he's probably driving safely because there's kids in the car with him. He is probably in Montana right now heading to Denver for the Lead the Cause. And there's uh, Faith Giltner and Andrew Martinoff are going down there, Courtney and Jason. And they're going to Lead the Cause in Denver, learning how to share. They're going to be doing some, it's not street preaching, but sharing the gospel with people in downtown Denver, learning how to share the gospel. Keep them in your prayers this week as they drive to Denver, spend the week there, and then drive back um, next Sunday. So keep them in your prayers. Um, one other thing, I'd just like to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all those that helped 
uh, put the house parsonage together this last couple weeks. Um, thank you for that. That was real, there was a lot of people. We had plumbers doing electrical. We had electric electricians doing plumbing. The house <laughs> should hold up. We apologize if it burns down. Um, and for those helping getting Luke and Laura in there, um, thank you. This body has been faithful to help in so many different ways. Um, oh, the other thing. Last week with our car wash, there was, now I can't remember the, name, the number, and Alyssa's not here to ask her the exact number, but I think it was $2,700 was raised for camp, so almost all the kids um, can go for just about free. Um, so nobody can't go to camp because of money. You guys were very, very generous in buying all the cookies. I think Ron bought a whole plate that he had to hide, but he brought it. I'm proud of you, Ron, for participating. Um, let's pray and be dismissed and have a wonderful Independence Day. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace that we see again and again. You are sure because you are God. You are the creator. You are sovereign. You are Lord. And we have a true hope in your promises because you are faithful to keep your promises. Thank you that we can put our hope in you. Father, bless this body as they go out today, enjoying family and fun and celebrating. Father, keep everyone safe. Uh, bless this body today. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen.